Good morning, everyone. Our scripture for today comes from the book of John, chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. Jesus cleanses the temple. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of this word. Will you join me in the spirit of prayer? God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer, amen. Tomorrow, tomorrow. It's been a year. Tomorrow, March 8th, it's been one year. One year since you sat in these pews without a care in the world, without a mask, without hand sanitizer, without tapes on the pews about where you can sit, without restrictions in place, without concern for your health. One year. On March 8th, there were 168 people here, and we dedicated baby Ace Wilhelm. The pews were packed full of his family and his friends and all of you, and we sang together and we prayed together and we passed the peace together, hugging and shaking hands. And then I took that little baby and walked him up and down the aisles, and you said, welcome, little one. We will take care of you and teach you. We will welcome you. This will be a place where you'll learn how to walk and you'll learn how to pray and you'll learn how to sing. And then it's as if we broke a promise to baby Ace because everything changed. He didn't learn to walk here. He hasn't been in this building to sing. We haven't continued with the traditions that we've had. It's been one year. Sure, we came back from July until October, but it wasn't the same. We were masked and we were far apart. There was no singing. There were no children. One year. I've been thinking a little bit about what a year looks like, what it feels like, how we mark it. And there's a song from a musical that I'm sure we've all heard of. The musical is Rent, and it talks about the time of a year and how we count it in this beautiful song. I'm sure you've heard it. The whole chorus sings together, 525,600 minutes, how do we measure a year in the life? And then the song goes on to think about ways that we measure it. In the song, it's cups of coffee and a lot of jolly things. But when we look back over the last year, we might change that song. 525,600 minutes, how do we measure a year in the life? For us, we might say, with masks, with inches on our hair since our last haircut. In the months it's been since we hugged our dearest friends. In the number of Zoom meetings we've attended. In the moments that have passed where we've longed for something normal. 
In the dinners, we've had to cook over and over and over again because restaurants were closed or takeout only or because we didn't feel comfortable there. In the dishes, in the utility bills, in the isolation, in the missed celebrations with rooms full of people. Maybe that's how we'd measure this year. And yet today, our scripture and our theme is about finding strength in the wilderness. How do you find strength in a year like that? How do you find God in a year like that? When we haven't done what we told Ace Wilhelm we would do, which is to gather here, to sing here, to dance here, to learn here. How do you find strength in that after a year like this? Well, our scripture is from the Gospel of John. I know, I know. It's probably surprising because we've been spending so much time in the Gospel of Mark, and here we are in the Gospel of John. And John is a totally different gospel. It's not even considered a synoptic gospel. Instead, this is a gospel that here we are in the second chapter, and already Jesus is in Jerusalem. Whenever we talk about the Gospel of Mark, where we've been before this, we talk about how Gospel of Mark is short, how it cuts over the childhood and birth of Jesus. But now we're in the Gospel of John, and it's just a totally different type of gospel. It starts famously, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. But then right here in the second chapter, Jesus is in Jerusalem. Skipped ahead. In those synoptic gospels, Jesus spends time in Jerusalem only at the very end, only as he's nearing the cross. But here we are in the Gospel of John, and he is in Jerusalem. In John's Gospel, Jesus travels to Jerusalem as an adult three times to celebrate the Passover, and so we know that his ministry lasted three years in Jerusalem, three Passovers. And Jerusalem and the Passover is significant. It's a significant setting for our scripture today, because Passover is the celebration of God's presence in the lives of devout Jews. Therefore, when Jesus refers to himself in the scripture as the temple at the Passover, he's making a point of God's presence in the world. But that's not all. In the scripture, he's angry. He's angry, and we're going to explore why. Now, he was not angry because there was commerce in the temple. No matter what you've heard, that's not true. Despite what we've heard or been taught, Jesus was not angry about the commerce in the temple. The money changers and merchants were allowed to conduct their business while they were there. So we often envision this passage as if it were people selling animals or sacrifice and placing bets down on the aisles of the sanctuary, right? The very house of worship itself. But that's not true. The reality is different. The activities and the commerce that Jesus disrupted occurred in the outer courtyard of the elaborate temple complex. So I don't know how much you know about the way these temples were made, but in the outer complex, all things were allowed and all people were welcome. Merchants and money changers had been set up in the temple courtyard for centuries, and worshipers were set up there with the commerce for centuries. But Jesus disrupted them on this day and in this passage. And he disrupted them because the chief priests and the scribes, the people with the highest status, had been profiting off the poor. They had been having an uneven distribution of resources. They hadn't been investing in their community. So some had become much more wealthy and powerful while the poor continued to languish. And this This is what disrupts Jesus in the passage. This is why he's upset. The unfair distribution of resources and wealth, and he's calling it out. So let's talk a little bit about the structure of the temple. The temple in Jerusalem was complex in its structure. A bunch of rectangles together going smaller and smaller to the center. Each one higher than the last and more restricted. The first was the court of the Gentiles, and Gentiles could go no further. And then the next was the court of the women, and for the same reason, women could go no further. Then it was the court of the Israelites, and there, the Israelites could go no further. 
Beyond that, the priests. And the priests had to stop there. They could go no further. And then finally, it was the inner sanctum. The holiest of holies. The most sacred spot of all in the temple. The very place where God touches the earth, right there at the very center of the temple. And in that inner holiest of holies, only the high priest and only on one day a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, could they enter. So the, the temple was the center of life and authority and trade and commerce. Anyone could be in the court of the Gentiles and then so on, more restrictive and restrictive and restrictive. And it was this that Jesus is objecting to. He, in the Gospels of Mark and Luke, it says, And he taught, saying unto them, It is not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. It's that, the thieves and the liars, that made Jesus so angry. Not the fact that they were buying and selling things in the outer courtyard. He was angry with the system that made temple authorities richer, that made high priests holier, that continued to just squash the access and the resources to God's people until it was only a few who had access to resources, to wealth, and to God. He was expressing righteous anger over these divisions and this hierarchy. And then he calls himself the temple. He turns everything on its head. Jesus came to tell the world that God was everywhere and that the temple should be torn down. Can you believe it? This was a profound statement. That that place with walls and doors and continuing restrictions, it should be torn down. That that was not the way of God. And that's exactly what happens. According to the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when Jesus dies on the cross, it says the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That means the place that was considered the holiest of holies that only one priest could enter on one day of the year is gone because God's Spirit is everywhere and everyone has access to it. Everyone, anywhere, has access to God's Spirit. And, what's more, Jesus always sides with the under-resourced, with those who have been squandered in their wages, in, in what they deserve, in the fairness of God's kingdom. He always sides, he always sides with the poor, with the oppressed, with the forgotten, with the overlooked. And it's in this passage that he is angry about the structures that prevent that justice and that equality. He says the temple should be torn down because God is everywhere and available to anyone. So how does this relate to our last year? This last year where we've measured a year by Zoom calls and six feet and masks and missed math, mass gatherings. Where we measure a year in the Sundays that have passed, where we have been worshiping online only, where we have missed the chance to see our brothers and sisters in Christ right here. How do we measure a year? You know, maybe it has been this very year that has once again taught us this gospel message that is 2,000 years old. You know, God doesn't just meet us right here, right where I stand, right in the collective of this space. No. What this year, what we can measure, what we have known and lived and experienced, is that the temple has been destroyed. The things that we were used to, the customs and the institutions and the practices, they have disappeared. And sure, they'll come back, but there has been something lost. And yet, God has shown up in your living room and kitchen, in your home, through the communion elements that you have brought to your screen and joined with us here. God has shown up in the Zoom calls that we have on Wednesday night and call it bread and broth and a space breaks open and we share our hearts. God has shown up in the drive-bys in the driveway visits, in the cards, in the outreach, in the connection that we've made. 
God's not in the temple, and God's never been in the temple. God is not contained only to this church, only to these four walls, only to the customs that we're so used to. No. God is present everywhere and anywhere that anyone goes. God is there. And that is the good news of this scripture. And that is the strength that we have all received in this last year of the wilderness. May you know it, may you believe it, and may you live it. Amen.